The 3rd Division was inching closer to Baghdad after the invasion started, and by early April of 2003, the U.S. forces resolved to take the Iraqi capital at any cost. Soon, they launched an armored advance throughout the city streets, and as the column pressed on into the center, the soldiers on the highway struggled to distinguish friend from foe. Eventually, the troops stopped a car on its tracks and found it was carrying an Iraqi army colonel who turned out to be the head of logistics for the Baghdad sector. This gave them hope. Their strategy was working. Confident, the formation kept moving forward, relatively unopposed, on their way to the Baghdad International Airport. But then, a smooth advance that would become known as the Thunder Run took an unexpected turn for the worse. Capitulate or else. At the height of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the most challenging phase of the ground campaign was looming. A decisive fight for Baghdad would settle the fate of the war. The U.S. Army's 3rd Division crossed the Kuwaiti border into Iraq on March 21, 2003. Three days later, U.S. and British warplanes started bombing Republican Guard bunkers guided by Special Forces troops on the ground. The intense raiding was a preamble for a main assault on the capital city, and U.S. Army 5th Corps troops soon formed a front line north of Karbala, 50 miles to the city's south. Meanwhile, extensive convoys of tanks and ground forces raced up from Kuwait. At least 36,000 elite Iraqi soldiers from three divisions waited ahead, roughly half of the total Republican Guard force. They were armed with the most potent weapons the Iraqi military had access to, including Russian-made T-72 tanks and heavy artillery. Soon, the coalition forces would encounter the Medina Division north of the front line, defending the route to Baghdad. The assault on the capital was brutal, as noted by an earlier night raid by Apache attack helicopters on the Medina Division's 2nd Armored Brigade. At least one helicopter was downed, while the rest were forced to retreat. The Iraqis, armed mainly with small arms and rocket-propelled grenades, offered fierce resistance. But as a senior British military source told The Guardian, quote, Before we start moving forward, these people have got to capitulate or be destroyed. No doubt. For several days, the coalition air power, made up of B-52s, Harrier GR-7 attack jets, and A-10 Warthogs, harassed the Republican Guard forces, conducting high-risk day and night bombardments at a rate of 1,000 sorties a day. U.S. aircraft also dropped hundreds of thousands of leaflets, warning civilians to stay home. The Delta Force and the SAS used lasers to identify targets for bombing, providing forward air control on the ground close to enemy positions. In addition, U.S. artillery units fired surface-to-surface -surface missiles south of Baghdad. The U.S. and Allied forces would also have to confront the Baghdad Division south of the capital and the Amara to the east, each comprised up to 12,000 men at full battle strength. A few days into the fighting, Washington started to realize that they had underestimated the number of troops needed. Nevertheless, the Allied forces, commanded by General Tommy Franks, fully committed to bombing the enemy as accurately as possible, paving the road for the subsequent incursion. While British forces became entangled in pockets of fierce Iraqi resistance across the south, the fighting extended into Umm Qasar, Basra, and Nasiriya. Meanwhile, the Americans endured heavy fire from the Republican Guard and attacks on their supply lines, leading to the plausible concern that the main force had overstretched in its advance on Baghdad. The fighting would only intensify as they advanced closer to the capital, but as Franks noted, quote, Our resolve is great, the morale is good, and as we always say, there's no doubt about the outcome. Baghdad International Airport On the morning of April 3rd, U.S. forces advanced toward an enemy stronghold that turned out to be the most strongly defended Iraqi position of the entire war, Saddam International Airport. On the first approach, the Americans lost two soldiers to mortar fire, 
and it took the 1st Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division several hours of brutal combat to take control of the crucial target. But then, just before sunrise, the U.S. troops were subjected to a ferocious counterattack, and the Tactical Operations Center became the target of small arms and mortar fire. Still under cover of darkness, and unbeknownst to the Americans, a handful of T-72 tanks breached their defense and got within a few hundred meters. A source on the ground later said, quote, It was not until a chemical reconnaissance vehicle was fired on, and a Bradley actually was hit by a T-72 main gun round, that the battalion became aware of its peril. The fortunate crew soon found out that the hit was merely a glancing one, and as they drove their vehicle to safety, a fire team destroyed two enemy tanks with a Javelin ATGM. Simultaneously, a passing M1 Abrams battered the remainder of the enemy vehicles. With dawn approaching, the bold attack on the TOC escalated, while rivers of infantrymen flooded into the area on foot. In an effort to contain the attack, Sergeant First Class Paul Ray Smith fought off the enemy to protect his team, a selfless action that earned him a posthumous Medal of Honor, the division's first since World War II. Smith's efforts and those of the entire 1st Brigade secured a critical position and brought the U.S. forces closer to the gates of Baghdad. A Clever Ruse By April 4th, the 3rd Division had advanced 400 kilometers into the heart of Iraq. Military planners were aware of the disastrous effects of house-to-house -house urban combat and sought to avoid it. In the end, they realized that seizing western Baghdad, or what was later dubbed the Green Zone, would be one of the main military objectives to secure the entire city. If the U.S. forces managed to seize only critical nodes and infrastructure, the targeted assaults would eventually weaken Saddam Hussein's regime, hastening its collapse. Just as important, the strategy did not demand the deployment of troops to clear every single block in the city. Meanwhile, the Iraqi military prepared for the impending attack, organizing hybrid groups of paramilitary and regular units. They also assembled improvised barriers and dismantled the eastern Diyala River bridges to block the invaders' mechanized units. However, the invaders had no clear picture of the state of the Iraqi defenses in the city, and U.S. intelligence had little clues to offer. The uncertain circumstances led the commander of the 3rd Division, Major General Buford Blount, to plot an armored raid into the capital to test the response. The U.S. Army's official history detailed, quote, imagery and other reports inexplicably showed almost no preparations within the city. There were numerous small fighting positions, but none of the deliberate defenses that common sense and Iraqi doctrine indicated. Intelligence and field reports painted a picture of mixed units thrown haphazardly into the fray with little command and control. It was unclear whether Baghdad was a trap, a clever ruse, or a hollow shell. The Thunder Run Major General Blount met with Colonel David Perkins, who commanded the 2nd Brigade, and presented him with the outline of the upcoming raid. An armored task force would advance through Highway 8 into central western Baghdad and loop towards the airport to rendezvous with the 1st Brigade. Perkins assigned Lieutenant Colonel Eric Schwartz and his 1st Battalion of the 64th Armored Regiment to execute the mission. By the following morning, Schwartz had assembled a task force of 29 M1 Abrams tanks and 14 M2 Bradley armored fighting vehicles. Task Force 164 Armor then began the raid that would go down in history as the Thunder Run. Starting in southern Baghdad, the armored vehicles advanced through the main roads, assessing what remained of the enemy defenses. A Company was to spearhead the party, and C Company would follow closely behind. At the rear, an attachment of C Company of the 3rd Battalion, 15th Infantry, would tail the advance. The raid into the suburbs began at 6.30 a.m. Not long after, numerous enemy positions on both sides of the road opened up on the column. Making matters worse, civilian activities did not cease, and the Americans tried their best to separate the hostile forces. Whenever a vehicle joined the highway, the troops would fire warning shots, forcing the unassuming drivers to turn around. But traffic on the opposite side was a different matter, as the vehicles had to be assessed and trail units advised. The official history noted, quote, avoiding harm to civilians who had no idea that the Americans had arrived in Baghdad proved impossible. 
Knockout. The column continued to press on towards the center against the defenders, who proved disorganized. But suddenly, an Abrams tank, commanded by Staff Sergeant Jason Diaz, was hit and immobilized. Schwartz was hesitant. If he risked recovering the tank, the entire task force would be vulnerable in a vital overpass. However, he couldn't just abandon the tank. Over the next 20 minutes, the task force offered cover, but became easy targets for the defense, who were now firing at static forces. Immediately, hundreds of infantrymen arrived to capitalize on the circumstances. On top of that, the crew was unable to extinguish the flames, and they had to be rescued by a fellow armored personnel carrier. Then, to prevent the Abrams from being seized by the Iraqis, the Air Force bombed the tank. Even so, the Iraqi Information Ministry would later claim credit for destroying it. On the front line. After resuming the advance, the task force encountered increasingly stiff opposition from infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. Staff Sergeant Stephen Booker was aboard an Abrams tank dubbed Another Episode that fired at the enemy with a 50 caliber machine gun. However, it suddenly malfunctioned. Booker then grabbed his M4 carbine and jumped out of the hatch, crawling into the top of the turret and re-engaging the enemy. From his position, he spotted an armored personnel carrier, and after relaying the enemy's position to his men, they were able to put it out of action. The leader stayed on top of the turret for several kilometers, fearlessly guiding his crew and firing at the enemy until he was hit. Booker would posthumously receive the Silver Star, which would later be upgraded to the Distinguished Service Cross. Meanwhile, the bulk of the task force advanced toward the objective, covering the final stretch to the airport. In a desperate attempt, the Iraqis placed concrete blocks on the road to stop the column, but the superior Abrams, equipped with front-mounted plows, rammed into the obstacles and smashed them. Having breached the improvised barrier, the remainder of the task force passed through and finally reached the airport. In only two hours, 20 minutes, the force finished the Thunder Run and linked up with the 1st Brigade. Two days later, the entire 2nd Brigade would conduct a second Thunder Run through the same route, but the path had been fortified in the intervening period. Senior leaders feared a more aggressive resistance than in the first encounter, and Perkins led his men through the original route north into Baghdad. However, he then veered east into the government district, and he and his men took control of the so-called Green Zone within a day, dramatically speeding up a critical phase in the Iraq War. Thank you for watching our video. Please subscribe to Dark Docs and the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for more epic stories from modern history. And make sure to hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.